All right, so I'm going to lay this here to remind me to show it to Kyle. Um, we have extra art of the week this week because I realized that um, I had something in my little art uh, picture packet that I should have brought last week. Um, we are up to the Emperor Titus and Domitian uh, so that year of four emperors, Vespasian was the one of the four that stuck. And he had two sons, Titus and Domitian. Titus was in charge of the siege at Jerusalem. He was not emperor yet. His dad was emperor, but he was in charge of that. And when he came back, he set up a memorial arch for the um, conquering of, of Jerusalem and the temple. And um, this is a close-up, and you can see the men carrying... You can see the seven-branched candle. We refer to it as a menorah now that was in the temple. This is the, the, these are the guys carrying the stuff. The temple furnishings are coming out of the temple. And they're headed to Rome. They have a weird, they have a weird history. Later um, in the early Middle Ages, a general is going to go and fight some guys in North Africa who were barbarians who had stolen some of the temple furnishings from Rome and taken them to Africa, and then they ended up in Constantinople. It's a very odd story. This is the arch, known as the Arch of Titus. And this is the guys carrying the temple furnishings out of, out of the temple. And this is a modern, I mean, this is there if you get to visit Rome ever, you can see. The Arch of Titus. Um, the second thing I brought uh, is uh, the, one of the next set of emperors. They call them the five good emperors <clears throat> because for the most part, they were pretty moral, decent, upstanding sorts. Um, they did not have any organized persecution of Christianity, although there was always danger, as we will talk about. Um, but there wasn't a mass movement across the entire emperor during their reigns. Um, uh, Nerva, Hadrian, but Trajan, I can't ever get the order right, I'm sorry. They're Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, Pius, Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Severus, I think. Don't hold me to that, okay? Trajan is an earlier, uh, like the year 110 AD, Trajan. And uh, he, he is the guy corresponding with Pliny in that letter I had you read that we're going to talk about. But he also uh, uh, fought on some of the frontiers, and it was under Trajan that the Roman Empire made its greatest expansion. After Trajan, it started contracting. It was sort of like hunker down and hold on to what we've got. Um, and then his successor, Hadrian, builds that wall in Britain, right? So this is, a, this is the, the column of Trajan. 113 AD, this is in celebration of his fight with the Dacians who are kind of north of the Black Sea. Um, and this is a close-up. Uh, so anyway, let me tell you about this pillar. It's got a spiral staircase inside. You can go to the top, which is awesome because it looks like kind of skinny. I'm like, this must be bigger than I thought. 185 steps. And it used to have a statue of Trajan on top, which makes sense, but the statue was removed or got toppled or whatever through time. And in the 1500s, they put a statue of Peter on it. So Peter is on top of the statue of a column of Trajan. Oh, and you can, St. Peter, Peter the Apostle. And, and so, and there are pictures, there's a scene of the battles in relief all around the column. And this is a close up of some guys bringing, uh, bringing supplies into a city and a river god the river god is arching up and he's watching them, which is cool. I think he's pretty cool, I think. The, the Trajan's Column. He looks friendly enough. Although if somebody that big came out of a river, it would just freak me out. All right. Some of these small ones I couldn't get big pictures of. Cool. Another one that you can see if you ever get to go to Rome. Um, all right. Let's take a look, first of all, at uh, these, these letters, the stuff that's in your reading guide. 
I'm not going to read the whole thing. I asked you to read it. I hope you did, because it's pretty interesting. But I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, Pliny was, um, here comes Kyle. Hey, Kyle, are you missing the paper that was the important events or obscure? OK, this is not your paper? That's not mine. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I gave you all a chance. Um, I worked hard. All right. Pliny was the governor, one of the provincial governors, and he wrote to the Emperor Trajan, builder of the column you just looked at, and said, basically, I don't know what to do about these people called Christians. Not quite sure. He says, I've, I've followed the following procedure. I interrogated them as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserve to be punished. I don't know what they do, but just being so doggone stubborn, they ought to be punished. There were others possessed of the same folly, but because they were Roman citizens, I signed an order for them to be transferred to Rome. So we already see, okay, this is what's going on. This is a, remember, this is a non-persecution time. But you're always liable to be turned in. And Pliny says, okay, when they come to my attention, when somebody turns them in, here's what they do. I question them. If they are not Roman citizens, I can deal one way with them. If they are Roman citizens, I need to have them sent to Rome because I can't, you can't pass capital sentence on anyone if they're a Roman citizen. Yes. I think it, um, for, for some reason, I think it's uh, really interesting and organized how being a Roman citizen, like, like paying for a Roman citizenship, like really affected uh, it did. It did. It did. It was. It was huge to be a Roman citizen. Yes, Ethan. Well, actually, the Romans were extremely open-minded. They would let almost anybody worship anything. But the Christians were the only ones who refused to add Caesar to the list. So you got to remember, they don't even see it as a religious thing at all, Ethan. They see it as a political thing. These people are an undercurrent of potential treason. Does that make sense? And because we're very religiously open-minded. Bring ISIS in from Egypt, we don't care. Bring Mithras in from the East, we don't care. We think you're the Lord, but we're just totally fine. As long as you do the pinch of incense to Caesar. Because they didn't see it. You know, they're not looking for a religion to save their souls. They're looking for a religion, a, 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 a ritual that says, I am a part of this society. And, and until we get that, until that mindset, it doesn't make sense to us. So here's, here's what Pliny says. Here's, here's, here's how you get out of it if you're arrested. Okay. Those who denied that they were or had been Christians, when they invoked the gods in words dictated by me, offered prayer with incense and wine to your image, which I had ordered to be brought for this purpose, together with statues of the gods, and also cursed Christ, none of which those who are really Christians can do, it is said. These, I thought, should be discharged. All you have to do to get away is curse Christ, offer the wine and incense, and say the, say the words that Pliny dictates to you. Um, they all worshipped your image and the statues of the gods and cursed Christ. Um, but listen to this, and this, you got to remember, this is one of the earliest accounts 
of what do Christians do when they get together and go to church? You know, Acts doesn't really tell us, honestly. There is no, you know, it said they, st they, they met together for the breaking of bread and prayer. There's no, there's no liturgical, there's no information. What does church look like? They asserted that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day every Sunday before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God. Responsively means um, like one group sings one part and the other group sings the other part back and forth. You do the parts back and forth. Um, and to bind themselves by oath. Not to do some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, adultery, not falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. When this was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. When they take this, whatever it is they're doing in secret, rumor has it, We've heard some of them talk about eating body and blood. We're disturbed by that. Are these people cannibals? We need to know, are these people cannibals? Like, no, you don't understand what we mean. Innocent and ordinary food. Um, even this they affirmed they had ceased to do after my edict, which in accordance with your instructions, I had forbidden political associations. See, they think it's a political association. Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out the truth by torturing two female slaves called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. I therefore postponed the investigation and hastened to consult you. All right. We have Trajan's response. You observed proper procedure, my dear Pliny. It is not possible to lay down any general rule to serve as a kind of fixed standard. They are not to be sought out. We are not going to go knocking on doors and say, are there any Christians here? If they are denounced and proved guilty, they are to be punished. With this reservation that whoever denies that he is a Christian and really proves it, that is by worshiping our gods, even though he was under suspicion in the past, shall obtain pardon through repentance. But anonymously posted accusations ought to have no place in any prosecution. This is both a dangerous kind of precedent and out of keeping with the spirit of our age. You can't just slide a paper under the prefect's door and say, so and so is a Christian. If you're going to accuse somebody, you got to stand there and I got to know you are the one accusing them. Because if you're just blowing smoke, as they say, I need to know who it was who was causing trouble and you're going to get the punishment. No anonymous accusations. It's actually, this is why he's one of the good emperors, okay? He's like, we're not going to go chasing them down. They don't seem to be a problem. If they're denounced by someone, we need to deal with it because technically this, this group is illegal. They're not fulfilling their civic obligations. And this is the way it was in a lot of early Christian history. We have a few waves of horrible persecution, empire-wide. But a lot of times it's just local. And so basically, you're a Christian and you do something that ticks your neighbor off and he goes and reports you to get even, that sort of thing. Or a group of people are in the marketplace, Christians, and they, they do something that offends someone and there's just they start a, a public outcry, a riot. We need to round up those Christians. There's a bunch of jerks. And then they would, they would round up usually the bishop you go for their leader, get the leader, and then it would die down, like mob violence tends to do. You know, it rises and then it dies down. That's most of, of the persecution. Nero's persecution was just basically in Rome. Domitian, Titus's younger brother Domitian, he's the first one, was like, we're getting, ri getting rid of these Christians. Everywhere, we're getting rid of the Christians. And it was horrible. We're going to talk about that um, uh, when we read um, the letter, First Clement letter. Um, also, Pliny gives us an eyewitness account of the destruction of Pompeii and the eruption of Vesuvius. 
same Pliny. Same Pliny, but many years before, because this is 79. What? Pliny the Younger. His uncle, Pl yes, Pliny the Elder. Well, if you read, well, maybe you didn't call him Pliny. Uh, my uncle. My uncle. That's Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder was a natural history writer, uh, 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 and so was Pliny the Younger. They were both profuse authors, you know, prolific authors. But uh, yeah, his uncle was with the fleet. He was in the military and he was stationed uh, across the Bay of Naples from Vesuvius. And that morning it started erupting and someone came to their villa and said, Pliny, will you come to bring some of the boats of the fleet and sail over there? My family is over there. My husband is over there. It's like, yeah, I'll do it. And he goes, and, and if you read, I'm not going to take the time to read it, but I hope you did, or I hope you will, because it's really amazing. Um, obviously, they did not think there was grave danger, because it says plenty, a couple of times he laid down and take, took a nap. And you might say, well, why did he not just sail back immediately? Because all the seismic activity made the sea really rough. The water was so rough, he didn't want to sail back across the bay. And they're just thinking, it'll die down. It'll die down. Now, I have in the back of your reading guide, you can kind of keep your place, but go back to the back with me, one of my handy-dandy outlines, um, and on page 113. At 1 p.m., a column of ash and pumice shot up 12 miles into the sky. And you know, you know, even if we don't, aren't really great on physics or, or anything, we can picture and use our imagination. If particles of dust and pumice and ash are up there, they're not going to stay up there forever, are they? They're going to start to condense and coalesce, and it's going to get heavier and heavier. And about midnight, it just all came crashing down, and you were dead. You were dead if you were on the ground. That was it. it says lower. They suspect that most victims died from a 900 degree cloud. Temperature, gas, smoke. Pliny the Elder died, it sounds like, before the big, because he was older and he was a little asthmatic. They said he snored really bad, as his nephew says. He, he, and often people with breathing issues snore. You know what I mean? And they use the breathing apparatus now. Um, so, and he was older. He wasn't in the best shape. He had kind of exerted himself in excitement that day. Um, and then there's lots of ash in the air already. There's gases. And he just, he was on the, on, the, on the beach and he just collapsed and he couldn't breathe anymore and he died. But everybody who was there waiting for a ride, waiting for a boat, or thinking, not like us, oh, that cloud's going to come back down. Like, oh, it's done. We made it. There was a little earthquake. We're all going to be okay now. <sighs> no, you're not. And um, buried Pompeii under 12 feet of ash and rock, Herculaneum under 65 feet. 2,000 2, casualties. Um, many of which we have found, um, or found the holes where they were. Um, in 1599, workers were digging a new channel, a uh, river channel, like a canal, and they started finding buildings. There are walls down there with paintings on the walls. What is that? 1738, workers building a summer house for the king of Naples found Herculaneum, digging the foundations for his new summer house. Nearly a third of the city is still unexcavated. They're taking their time until maybe new and better techniques for exploring. You know, they don't want to dig it up too fast. Um, and they found, and this is the rest of my, you know, outline, they found all sorts of pictures. I brought you in some pictures of, um, you know, paintings on the wall, people. 
I, when you guys were younger, I brought this, those of you who did my junior high, Greece and Rome, I brought this same book in. Um, so this is a repeat. Uh, they found these weird empty places in the, in the ash, in, in the solidified ash until they started exploring it and they figured out they are the outlines where a body had been. Um, but the body had rotted away. But if you pour plaster in the hole and then you chip away around it, it reveals the outline of the body. So we have found a lot of these. We know, we know how they were laying when they died. Some of them with a hand over their face because they can't breathe. Some of them lying together. There was one, uh, an adult and a child lying together. He's trying to protect the child. Can't, prote can't protect anybody from that. Um, they found food. Um, fossilized, the minerals from the ash had gone into the eggs. 2,000 year old eggs from somebody's dinner or breakfast just left there when basically all, all hell broke loose. And I mean that not frivolously at all. That's what it must have seemed like. Um, and, uh, and buried them. Uh, so we find, we find not the people, like I said, those aren't, those aren't, those aren't fossilized people. Those are plaster poured into a space that was left by where the people used to be. Um, so we know a lot about them and kind of fun. We also know them maybe better than we know a lot of people in the ancient world because they left everything behind them and it got perfectly preserved, including the graffiti on their walls. And so I also brought in, in the back of your reading guide, because it's just so fun and because, guys, if you don't learn anything else this year, learn that people in all time periods are the same. They're the same feelings about things. They do the same stupid stuff and silly stuff. Here's some of the, of the graffiti. Um, this is a conversation two guys who are rivals for the same girl. The first guy writes, success is a weaver, loves the innkeeper's slave girl named Iris. She, however, does not love him. Still, he begs her to have pity on him. His rival wrote this. Goodbye. And then below, envious one, why do you get in the way? Submit to a handsomer man and one who is being very, very, treated very wrongly and good looking. And the next guy says, I've spoken. I've written all there is to say. You love Iris, but she does not love you. It's just randomly on the wall in Pompeii. And then, but it gets, Satura was here on September the 3rd. Don't people do this today? I mean, don't you see stuff like this in bathroom stalls or, you know, like on any, on overpasses? Antiochus hung out here with his girlfriend, Cythera. Um, this sounds like it's on a hotel and inn. Let water wash your feet clean and a slave wipe them dry. Let a cloth cover the couch. Take care of our linens. This seems like good advice. Whoever loves, let him flourish. Let him perish who knows not love. Let him perish twice over, whoever forbids love. We have a philosopher. And then next we have Stephilus was here with Quaita. Alphidius was here. Goodbye. <laughs> Salatus, the Thracian gladiator, is the delight of all the girls. <laughs> Publius Comesius Restitutus stood right here with his brother. And then we have an advertisement. The city block of the REE Polii is in possession of Nias, Elias, Nigidius, Maius. Is available to rent from July 1st. There are shops on the first floor, upper stories, high classrooms, and a house. A person interested in renting this property should contact Primus, a slave of Nias, Alias, Nigidius, Maius. It's just, it's a one, it's a one ad. It's a, it's an ad. No, no. And then this one, I have no idea why this would be written on a, on a wall. On April 20th, I gave a cloak to be washed. On May 7th, a headband. On May 8th, two tunics. He's keeping his laundry list on the wall. Why? This next one I love. Hectic you baby, Mercator says hello to you. <laughs> Cruel Lalagus, why do you not love me? Then my total all-time favorite. 
If anyone does not believe in Venus, they should gaze at my girlfriend. And then, this sounds like it's on the outside of an inn restaurant. The finances officer of the Emperor Nero says this food is poison. <laughs> really, they did not get a good meal at this particular restaurant. These are the people of Pompeii. And you know what? They're just people. They're just doing the things that people do in a city. It's goofy. It's funny. They're arguing with each other. They just have to say, I stood here. Why? No one cares. Well, but you know what? I sort of care after 2,000 years. Like, it's cool. Now I care that Alphidius Rufus was there. But at the time, nobody cares. <laughs> like, just stop, stop writing in the walls, Alphidius Rufus. Um, Anyway, I hope you find that fun. I think it's hilarious. Um, there are many, many more. I have a whole book of them, but unfortunately, all I will say is m many of them are not suitable for the consumption of the non-adult crowd, shall we say, as many of the modern graffiti things written in bathrooms and other places are also not, in my opinion, for the consumption of the... They're not even for the consumption of the adult crowd thing, frankly. Nobody should be reading these. Um, all right, so that is Pliny and the Emperor Trajan. Um, 110, 120 AD is our time period. Um, now, before we launch into looking at our early church father's book, um, Carson brought up this letter that you're writing. Um, I wrote these on the board as a reminder that I would like you to include these. Um, so my first question is, is there anyone who doesn't know what any of these mean? It's not, don't feel stupid. If you are not sure, please ask. You know, it's always, I, I'm a non-asker. I will share this with you. I'm afraid to ask questions. But it gets to the point where you don't know and it gets embarrassing, to, you know what I mean? Like you don't ask right away and then you don't know. But eventually you have to ask. So if everybody's good with that, I would like you to, just a reminder, it would help me ever, ever, ever so much if you would mark them. You do not have to type them in. Just print out the paper and grab a pen and put a P or an A or an L in the margin. But when I have 45 papers to read in a week, it really helps me if I don't have to search or I just give up and I just accuse you of not doing it because I missed it. I don't want to do that, okay? Um, Carson, tell me again what you said, how are you feeling about this letter? What is your... Okay. Okay, so how do the letters of Paul and the letter of Clement, quite frankly, how do they usually start? Yes. Grace to you and peace from our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ to whoever, the church and wherever. And my answer to you, Karsten, is what, what is wrong with doing that? You can totally do that. I know, but don't all Paul's letters start exactly the same? I mean, roughly. Let's, I mean, they're great. I, don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing the Bible as, as God's word, but I'm just saying um, that you can start that way. However, if we want to do an update, we and you have two choices here, remember. You can imitate the sound and the feel of the first century or second century, if you want to. Sort of flowery, right? But you don't have to. How do we start letters? Hi. Dear so-and-so. I've been thinking about all of you lately. I've been wondering how things are going there. I heard this is something you're dealing with. Let's talk about that. But before we do, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on here. Then if you want to amplify, if you want to include, why will you tell them? so that we can share one another's burdens in love, as it tells us in scripture, so that we can all be armed and ready if there's a problem spreading, so that we can learn from each other's mistakes. So that, see, this is an invention, right? I'm thinking of all the reasons why I should be, why would I write this letter? 
Mrs. Ferguson told me to, that's not a good, no, you can't try that. Why is Paul writing these letters? Why is Clement writing these letters? Why is Ignatius writing these letters? It's not always the same reason. But think about the reason. Why do we write letters? To, and maybe you guys don't write letters. This is what makes it challenging. Maybe you're not, letter writing is an art that is dying, unfortunately. And maybe that's will make this a hard, a hard, you know, uh, project for you, assignment for you. But you have several things you need to think about. So jot these down to, to brainstorm from, okay? You need some sort of greeting. And I don't care if it's an old-fashioned imitation greeting. It's totally fine. It can be as flowery and long as you want. Or it can be a more modern-sounding greeting. I don't care. Why am I writing? Now, this, the answer to this, there's not just one answer. It depends on, are you making up churches with made up problems, you know? Are you, are you writing really legit from your church community to, you know, the church that a friend of yours goes to? I don't know. Is there a problem? Is there a problem there? Are you worried? Uh, it, 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 do you have news to share? Uh, do you um, do you know them personally? Are there? Do, how long? Do when did you visit them last? How, how have you gotten news from them? So you see, when you start asking your, yourself questions, you just, it just starts pouring out. And like, I got, I got half a page already, and I'm not even throwing scripture in. And then what are you or your church doing? What's happening where you are? This could be true. Maybe you tell them about the different missionaries, if it's your real legit church, the different missionaries that your church supports. This would be a really good, ask your parents. Go look in your church bulletin. You know, find out what missionaries does your church support? What are they doing? That's, that's like a whole page for some churches. Do you know what I mean? And we sent money off to so-and-so. They are in Moldova right now, and they are setting up a small church, but they need a car, and they, you know, and we're trying to raise money. See, so you could just go on and on and on, yes. Have you, how have you gotten news from them? Like if you're getting news, like so-and-so came with a letter from you. So-and-so came and they told us this was happening. See, all those stock things that are in these letters, you can include them too. And obviously, in some of this, you're going to have to fabricate because I'm assuming there isn't. Although maybe if it's another church that's in town and you have a friend that attends that church, like so and so came over and told me this is what was going on in your church. Yes. Sure, sure. I'm very open-minded about this assignment. Okay, so because I know it's kind of tougher. Yeah. So I'm 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 open. I'm open. So what what are you doing? And then what is happening? What is happening there? Is there trouble? Is there success and joy? Did something good happen? Maybe both. Is there sin that needs to be addressed? This could also apply to your own church. Is there a victory to be celebrated? And I think that if you just were to let your imagination wander and fill in as many blanks as possible, you, you'd, you'd have like a page to a page and a half already. 
If you don't be afraid to be detailed, you need to, this is, this is wonderful. Put yourself into a time when this is the only way to get news from someone else. We send emails that are very short, right? Usually or texts or however you guys communicate, you know. Because we see it's very easy. You can just call them. Like you can, you could email them every day and tell them what's going on. But what if this is the only way you can communicate with them? Does that make sense to everybody? You need to put a lot of information because there might not be someone going there again for a long time. I know I am challenging you with this. There will be no beatings. If it's like a page and a half. Or you, I want you to stretch yourself, though. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine. Also, there, I saw a meme on Facebook. I, I, we need to move ahead, but it was scenes from. It, it, the caption was, uh, "Herod, you know, Herodotus," and then it was two pictures from Pirates of the Caribbean. I think it was the third one, and and they find I don't know. They find like Davy Jones's chest or something, and and a guy turns to Jack Sparrow. He says, "You were telling the truth," and Jack Sparrow said. I often do that, but everyone always seems surprised. And it's Herodotus talking. You were telling the truth. I often do that, but everyone always seems surprised when Herodotus is right. Um, OK, that was an aside. Um, does this make you feel better? Does, this, does everybody feel a little better about this? And then if you work to stick these in, and then does everybody know in most study Bibles, I brought this for another purpose. But you know, in the back, there's often a concordance. You know, in this Bible, not only can I look up subjects, and it tells me all the, but I can look up particular words. Every verse that has this word in it, like use that, use that. I'm sure you probably have a computer one. Uh, good luck. If you do, I will read it. OK. Um, we need to move on, but I don't want to move on until I, I feel that everyone is OK. Does everyone feel OK? And if I told you, if you have a page of the two pages and it's all Bible verses, that's a win-win because you've done an excellent imitation of what these letters were like. And you've written down a bunch of scripture, which is always good for you. So it's a win on both directions. OK. All right. If you have any problems, I mean any, or questions, you can email me. You can call me. Check my email at least a couple times a day. If I'm home, I will pick up. Not leave a message on my answering machine. I will call you as soon as I get back in, OK? I'm, and I mean that. I don't ever want you to sit floundering with an assignment I don't know what to do, right? And some of you have taken advantage of that. You've emailed me questions, and I've always tried to get back, and I think, I think it's helped. So that, that is my pledge. Don't, don't ever get in a funk because you don't know what to do. Talk to me. OK. We're good? Can we move on? OK. All right. Let's take a look at these amazing letters. May I take this away? Oh, uh, EJ, are you, still, are you still writing? OK. Um, what have I done with my marker? OK, and, and your figures of speech. OK. Um, I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, we um, are meeting a martyr today, Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch. And um, yeah, I've told you guys before, does anybody remember what the word martyr actually means? What does it mean, Alex? That, that is generally what we mean what, when we use it today. But it, it, let's see if I can do it. Martyr. That's in Greek. Martyr means a witness. A martyr is a witness. And a, not an eyewitness. A witness who testifies to the truth of something with their deeds. So in the ancient world, you did not necessarily have to die to be a martyr. 
Today, that's what we mean. If you say someone is a martyr, we assume they died. But the early church uses this term for people who held up under torture and didn't curse Christ and give the pinch of incense to Caesar. People who languished in prison, in a dirty, cockroach-infested prison, but then were later released. People who are going to go through the rest of their life maimed in some way from those experiences. Those people were all considered martyrs. They, through their fortitude, witness to the fact that the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are real. They carried me through this. I am a witness to the truth of this. But many of them either succumbed to the prison or the torture, or they were outright executed. But um, so it's a, it's a martyr. Martyrs are witnesses. And I like this because, frankly, I don't want to be killed. I don't think that's a news flash. I don't think anybody in here really wants to be killed. I don't want to be killed for being a worshiper of Jesus. I hope that I hope that if it came to it, I would be willing. But I don't want to have to be willing. Do you see what I mean? But but I can in my own small way, be a martyr, perhaps, because I can bear witness under bad circumstances that this is true. Do you know what I mean? An ever so minuscule martyr, not on the level of I was tortured. But you know, can I even bear witness when something goes wrong in my life? Can I not freak out? Can I trust God? When I'm with a group of people and they all want to do something I know I shouldn't be doing, can I bear witness enough to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna risk your mocking and say, no, I'm not doing it, you know, and be just like the ever little crumb of martyrdom as compared to these guys. But it opens up the field. Do you, do you see what I mean? To be a witness. Um, so anyway, uh, we ask ourselves how, how we are called to be witnesses. Um, I, we are not, Things will have to change a lot in America before we start getting thrown into prison just for being Christians. Um, they may change. They may change someday. I don't know. But, uh, but things happen all the time, and, uh, and I am bearing witness in how I react to them. Uh, people are watching. People are watching us. People are watching you. Okay. The first letter we looked at was the letter of Clement. Clement was the third bishop of Rome, and he wrote a letter to Corinth, to the church in Corinth. And I asked you, what problem? Now, you see, he never says it outright. You kind of have to read between the lines here. There's hints. What do you guys think the problem in Corinth is? Was it hard to read between the lines? Okay, any specific kind? Yes, yes. Apparently, um, he uses this term over and over, schism. Schism. And let's talk about that word, and then I'm going to read a bajillion times he, he talks about this schism. Heresy, like we talked about last week, is just flat out uh, not believing certain things that are pivotal to the Christian faith, all right? Um, I don't believe in the virgin birth, or I don't believe Jesus is really God or something like that. That'd be heretical. Schism is when two groups of Christians don't really disagree about what you believe so much as uh, often procedure or taste or opinion. And there's like, we're just going to start our, a church over here. So for instance, um, this would be more of a modern day example. I, I, I don't like the songs that church sings. I'm going to go over here and start my own church. And the early church is like, you're schismatic. You're schismatic. You, you don't have, you can't just leave that group and go start your own church. No, that's schismatic because we are one. Now, we live in a world, in a society, okay, first of all, we're used to there being different denominations. You have to remember, there's one church. They have one church. The Christian church. That's all there is. That's the only game in town. If you're out there in the Christian church, you've withdrawn yourself from the community of Christians. And no, you can't go into schism. Um, 
and uh, and it's protective, you know. Um, well, actually, let's talk, we'll talk about that later because I think I asked that question with Ignatius. So Clement says this: um, we we have been long in turning our attention to your quarrels. We refer to the abominable and unholy schism, so alien and foreign to those whom God has chosen, which a few impetuous and headstrong fellows have fanned to the such pitch of insanity that your good name, once so famous and dear to us all, has fallen into the gravest ill repute. And now I'm, I'm just gonna skip through and read things I highlighted, okay? But I'll show you how much he pounds the point home. From this there arose rivalry and envy, strife and sedition, persecution and anarchy, war and captivity. He tells the story of Cain and Abel. You see, brothers, rivalry and envy are responsible for fratricide. There's some sort of rivalry, there's some sort of envy, and there are two camps in the church of Corinth. Um, he says, let us then, brothers, be humble and get rid of all pretensions and arrogance and silliness and anger. Especially let us recall the words of Jesus Christ, when he, which he uttered to teach considerateness and patience. There's a group of people stirring up trouble in Corinth. And there's another group that's losing their, <laughs> losing their temper with them. Um, we should obey God rather than follow those arrogant and disorderly fellows who take the lead in stirring up loathsome rivalry. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop. I, I could go on, but I feel like this gives you a good dose. Um, uh, there are two camps in the church in Corinth, and they are not agreeing. Now, here's why I brought my Bible along, one of the reasons. A generation before, listen to what Paul wrote to Corinth. My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Another, I follow Christ. They were doing it 40 or 50 years before Clement. What is up with the Corinthian church? They had camps and cliques back in Paul's day, and they still do in Clement's day. They still do the same. I think it's amazing. It's the same problem. So how does Clement say that the church is like an army? I directed you to page 60. Yeah, what do you think, Ethan? Yes. Let us note with what discipline, readiness, and obedience those who serve under our generals carry out orders. Military men... They have people in charge, and they take orders, and they do it. He says, not everybody is a general, colonel, captain, sergeant, and so on. But each in his own rank carries out the orders of the emperor and of the generals. Clement believes the church is like that. You have leaders. Those leaders have been specifically put in charge. You need to obey them. Stop your little party that goes and has a picnic over here and complains about your leader and says how much better you would do and how you would do everything different if you were in charge. Stop it. Because if soldiers did that about their commanding officer, they would be court-martialed. But you just freely do it. And I'm going to add to Clement. I feel like in Clement's mind he might add. And what's more important? earthly military matters or spiritual matters, the heavenly realms. You even obey your earthly leaders and you don't obey your heavenly leaders. What's up? Stop. Um, instead of causing strife or schism, what does Clement suggest you ought to do? Yeah, well, Alex. Not 
That's okay. Did anybody else find something? Yeah, was it? Um, here's, here's what he says on page 68. Uh, this is the second paragraph. I'm going to start partway through. Well then, who of your number is noble, large-hearted, and full of love? Let him say, if it is my fault that revolt, strife, and schism have arisen, I will leave. I will go away wherever you wish and do what the congregation orders. Only let Christ's flock live in peace with their appointed presbyters. Rather than cause a problem, you ought to just be willing to do whatever they say. If they say, I need you to leave, and that would probably mean leaving the town. All right, because there's only, probably at this point, there's, there's one church in your town. There are, there's one congreg Christian congregation. If you want me to, I will leave. I will relocate before I will rip apart the body of Christ. That's pretty extreme. But he says, that's what you should do. How does one do this? On page 66, I got to read part of this letter. Who can describe the bond of God's love? Who is capable of expressing its great beauty? The heights to which love leads are beyond description. Love unites us to God. Love hides a multitude of sins. Love puts up with everything and is always patient. There is nothing vulgar about love, nothing arrogant. Love knows nothing of schism or revolt. Love does everything in harmony. By love, all God's elect were made perfect. Without love, nothing can please God. By love, the master accepted us. Because of the love he had for us and in accordance with God's will, Jesus Christ, our Lord, gave his blood for us, his flesh for our flesh, his life for ours. You see, brothers, how great and amazing love is. Does anybody know what this sounds really a lot like? Where is that in the Bible, Karsten? Corinthians. First Corinthians 13, the love chapter. First Corinthians. Paul, it's the same. He's echoing, do you see? Clement knows the letters that Paul wrote. He knows them thoroughly. And he's not just out of the blue making something up. He's reminding them of something that their fathers were told by Paul. That's how they're going to read it. That's how they're going to see it. He's not trying to be original. Original is overrated. <laughs> he's trying to be true. True is good. And he's, he's imitating Paul's points in 1 Corinthians. Um, okay, what does he hope will happen in the Corinthian church? This was a little vague. There are many, many correct answers to this question, so don't be afraid. Okay, okay. You must live in harmony, bow the neck, and adopt the attitude of obedience. You will make us exceedingly happy if you prove obedient to what we, prompted by the Holy Spirit, have written, and rid yourselves of your wicked and passionate rivalry. That is first Clement, dealing with a problem that apparently is just endemic in the Corinthian church. We just divide into cliques and we argue with each other. Some people have speculated that perhaps they actually ejected their leaders, you know, but they're certainly in rebellion against their leaders and they're not, they're not doing what the leaders of the church are telling them to do. And they're apparently a little bit full of themselves and think they know best, yeah. Arminianism? Vision is bad. Um, and uh, which takes us into the letters of Ignatius. 
Bishop of Antioch. Um, Antioch is, I, I, I'm sorry, I brought a map so we could look at Antioch on the map and then I folded it up. Yeah, I probably, um, Antioch is on the coast of the Mediterranean, just north of Israel, you know, farther up. You know how um, Israel's here and Egypt's down here and the coast goes up and then it kind of makes an abrupt turn and turns into what's today Turkey. Um, it's right up at that, at that turn, just right off the seacoast, of an important, wealthy city in the ancient world. And, and Ignatius was in charge of the, of the Christian congregation there. And apparently there was some sort of uprising, local, one of these local, like Pliny and Trajan we're talking about. Somebody got ticked off with the local Christian community in Antioch. We don't know who, we don't know why. But they went straight for the leader. Get their leader. He's the ringleader of the whole operation. Take him out. <coughs> and they arrested Ignatius. And they carried him overland through what is today Turkey until they got to the coast and then put him on a boat and took him to Rome where he was fed to animals in the brand new Colosseum that Vespasian had built just about 20 or 30 years before. Yes. And he knew it. He knew it. And so as he's traveling through Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today, the neighboring cities heard that he was coming through and heard what had happened. And many of them sent the bishop of the local congregation to see him, to pray with him, to commiserate with him, to encourage him. And these are letters he sent back to some of those congregations. I loved your bishop, bishop whoever was here with me. He told me about your faith. Um, and so what I'd like to do, I'm going to look at some of the individual letters, but do you, do you notice they're very similar to each other? They have a lot of similarities. He generally praises their bishop, praises their faith, tells them to hold fast to what they believe, tells them that he's ready for this. I am ready to die for my Lord. And he uses the phrase, I want to get to God. I want to do this. I want, I want, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go and be with him. Say it again, Simeon. He does, you know, for modern tastes, he does seem a little ready. We're going to, his letter to the Romans is specifically over the top for our taste, but we're going to look at that one on its own. But I'd like to kind of look at these all together for some of these questions. Um, and the first one um, about stressing obedience to your bishop. I just want to, I just want to read, I'm just going to go through and read you some passages uh, that I marked. So you can get a got an idea again. Um, okay. United in your submission, subject to the bishop and the presbytery, for Jesus Christ, the life from which you can't be torn is the Father's mind, and the bishops too, appointed the world over, reflect the mind of Jesus Christ. Um, he says. All the meetings, at these meetings, your church meetings, you should heed the bishop and presbytery attentively. Break one loaf, one communion, which is the medicine of immortality and the antidote which wards off death but yields continuous life in union with Jesus Christ. Um, uh, there, there's a Roman Catholic, it's a, one bread, one body. The idea that you have one communion loaf, it, just like we are one body. Like all the pieces come off the one loaf. We're all one body. I know not all churches have their communion like that. But um, uh, he says, as the Lord did nothing without the Father, Jesus did nothing without the Father because he was at one with him. So you must not do anything without the bishop and presbyters. Um, right, hold on. Um, defer to the bishop and to one another as Jesus Christ did to the Father in the days of his flesh, and as the apostles did to Christ, to the Father and to the Spirit. And that way we shall achieve complete unity. Um, hold on, I'm just, he pulled out of the stop here. When you obey the bishop as if he were Jesus Christ, you are, as I see it, living not in a merely human fashion, but in Jesus Christ's way. Um, act in no way without the bishop Submit to the presbytery as to the apostles, 
everyone must show the deacons respect. They represent Jesus Christ. Just as the bishop has the role of the father and the presbyters are like God's council and an apostolic band. You cannot have a church without these. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. If you are at one with the bishop, then you will have eternal and perpetual joy. Um, there's one more, I promise you. Um, it was the spirit that kept on preaching in these words, do nothing apart from the bishop, keep your bodies as if they were God's temple, value unity, flee schism, imitate Jesus Christ as he imitated the Father. Okay, so it's no, there's no doubt at all that Ignatius thinks that unity and obedience are really important. We all agree with that. He talks about it and talks about it and talks about it. And I asked you, and I asked you to look in the book of John, um, why do you think he thinks this is so very important? What makes unity and obedience of importance to him? And I sent you to John chapter 17. Do you want to look it up? Oh, I've got it. I've got, you know, don't, hey, I lugged my Bible all the way here. So, yeah. Um, as you sent me, this is Jesus. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for those, them alone. I pray also for those who will believe to me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This, in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, this is the last prayer of Jesus before he's arrested. His final prayer is that they may be one. He said, just like I am in you, let them be in me, and let them be one. Why? So that they may believe that you have sent me. I think Ignatius thinks that this unity is the mark of Christians, and when it's broken, we are bad witnesses. Does that make sense to everybody? That you gotta be one. Are you gonna like everybody you go to church with? No. Get over it. That's not me talking. This is Ignatius talking. Yeah. And this is Clement talking. All right. I am the voice of the past for you. Um, do, did your leader make a decision you don't particularly like? Get over it. Get over it. Because they have been put there by God. Deal with it. Because maybe there's a problem with you. Right? It's not me talking. This is Clement and Ignatius talking. It's harsh words for us, particularly because we are very used to being massively schismed. We have, we, we've institutionalized schism because we have so many different kinds of churches, but, but not for them. And, and, then, and that's what I want to show you. What did these people think and believe? That's what, you know, if things that we talk about don't theologically or, or uh, ritually line up with the church you attend, I, that's, that's a wonderful conversation to have with your pastor or your family. But I just want to show you, what did they think? What did they think was important? This is obviously very, very important to Ignatius. Um, it not only shows us, shows the world that we are one body, but it also protects us from those heresies. You know, some joker comes to town, he's peddling some brand of Christianity that's a loth. You know, it's like mm, kind of a weird version. And you go, you go to the bishop, it's like, what's up with that? It's like, no, you, this is where the truth is. This is the truth that's been handed down from our fathers. Stay, if, uh, can I use the analogy of the shepherd and the sheep? You know, stay in the sheepfold. Because the sheep that wander away, they fall down in the ditches, right? They fall down the cliffs and somebody's got to go rescue them. Don't go there. It's not safe. Be where the truth has been handed down. Don't go out there. So it's, it's, it's a safety measure too. Because we got guys traveling around the, the Roman world already peddling weird religions and sometimes calling themselves Christians. 
And uh, the reading for next week, it gets even weirder, some of the stuff they start peddling. Um, so there are specific groups um, peddling these things. What does it seem that the, the people in Smyrna are teaching? What are they teaching, Ethan? Do it. Well, is it too long? Yeah, you skipped it. Refusing to acknowledge that he carried around live flesh. Yes. This is exactly what they're believing. Let me let me throw a couple of additions in. Uh, they refuse to admit that the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ um, because he had no flesh and blood. Um, let me add, um, uh, you should regard, oh, that's more like unity. Um, yes, just a second. Just one. Um, 113, 114. Uh, let me go back to a page, 113. Um, regarding our Lord, you are absolutely convinced that on the human side, he was actually sprung from David's line, son of God, according to God's will and power, actually born of a virgin, baptized by John, that all righteousness might be fulfilled in him, actually in the flesh, under Pontius Pilate and Herod the Tetrarch. It is not as some believers say that his passion was a sham. It is they who are the sham. I like that line. Yes, and their fate will fit their fancies. They will become ghosts and apparitions. For I am convinced and believe that even after the resurrection, he was in the flesh. Skipping down, he calls him a real human being. But I warn you in advance against wild beasts in human shapes. You must not only refuse to receive them, but if possible, you must avoid meeting them. Just pray for them that they may somehow repent. If what our Lord did is a sham, so is my being in chains. The, the problem we deal with in the modern world is often people who don't believe Jesus is God. There's a guy. He's a great guy. You know, pretty smart. He's really nice. It's good to follow his example. He's a guy. That's the prevailing heresy of our world. And it's weird for us. The prevailing heresy in the early church was the other. He's not really a man. He never was really a man. This is called docetism. These people are called docetists because the word dokio in Greek means to seem or appear. And so it was like Jesus just came down and he was sort of like a hologram or some sort of spiritual being, but he wasn't really a body. And you might ask yourself, why in the world would anyone think that? I will tell you. This group of people, the Gnostics that we talked about, they really dug Plato, all right, like Plato. And as those of you who read with me last year, you remember that, that Socrates and or Plato seemed to really kind of wish they could get rid of their bodies. You know, it's like, oh, this body is such a drag. I could be a pure philosopher. I could live with the forms, you know, and but these bodies, oh, you know, and this is a bummer that we have bodies. And this philosophy sort of mushroomed till there were groups of people who taught that matter is evil. It's wicked. Everything made of matter is wicked. And if that's true, God can't have it, right? If matter is thoroughly wicked, God can't have a body. So he must have come as just some sort of apparition spirit thing and just sort of looked like he was crucified but he wasn't really, because we all know that matter is wicked and God can't ever touch matter. We will, we will expound on that a little bit next week because we'll talk about the full-blown Gnostics and some of the weirdness they were peddling. Um, they were a group that believed this. Just like Alex had his up first.
apparently they forgot that God made the universe and called it their own. They believed it was a different God. See, you, you, blew, you blew the lid off next week's surprise. Yeah, no, the Gnostics thought that the God of the Old Testament was the creator of the world, that he was an evil, he was a lesser God, and the God that sent Jesus was a higher God, and this was the secret knowledge that they, oh, oh, it's, oh, remind me next week, and I'll tell you all about the pleroma and the eons and the hierarchy and the Sophia wisdom that broke away from the rest of the gods. Oh, they had a whole story. Yeah. No. So the whole the creation of the world was basically an accident. It's like, oh, that stupid God that created the world. He he was messed up. Okay. I'm not doing justice to Gnosticism here, but you will read in next week's readings in Eusebius a little bit about some of these Gnostics, and it will talk and we'll talk more at length about them. But that's just a that's just a preview. That's a taste. Uh, but Ethan, you're exactly right. The people in Smyrna had a group of these people that were peddling this idea that, that Jesus didn't really have a body. And, and that's so foreign to us because we're used to the other one. People saying Jesus was just a body. He wasn't really God. And so it's always kind of weird. Um, so that's what they're talking in Smyrna. What about the Magnesians and the Philadelphians? What um, they seem to have a little of the do docetism, but there was another big biggie um, it, to, in the letter to the Magnesians and the letter to the Philippians. Did anybody hear? I see one on page 97 in the letter to the Magnesians, if you've got your book, sort of towards the top, towards the top of 97. Again, you have to read between the lines. He doesn't say, this group of people are wicked, don't listen. It's like the second or third full sentence, second, on page 97. It is monstrous. Okay, now stop. Okay, all that in mind, go to page 109. Yeah. Go to page 109 uh, by line the six. It starts now. 109. And there's a little line, line six. Or it's paragraph six, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. What are these people being peddled? And you, see, I'm not, I don't know if you have enough information to know. Wait, first of all, what, what are they promoting? What are these people promoting? Judaism. And you might say, well, aren't they allowed to do that? No, they're not. Yeah, they're promoting the fact, the idea that Christians must fully become Jews to become Christians. They are Judaizers. Paul is already dealing with them. In fact, I don't remember which of his letters, but he just out and out rips them. Paul, and he says, those mutilators of the flesh, he calls them. Those mutilators, because they're making people be circumcised. They're making Gentiles be circumcised. They're saying, you must follow the entire Jewish law if you're going to be a Christian. That's what they're peddling. It wasn't so much... Judaism as, see, the, the Christians this early, in fact, I was reading ahead for next week and Eusebius was talking about the fact that up until the time of Trajan and Hadrian, the entire church in Jerusalem was all Jewish still. So it's not, it's not that they hate Jewish converts and it's not that they hate the Jews, even... What? It's, it's that they want us to 
yeah, they want us to become Jews, to become Christians. And this was blown out by the council in Jerusalem, in the, in the book of Acts, presided over by James the Just, when they said, what do we need to tell these Gentile believers to do? And they said, well, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to tell you, don't eat blood and avoid sexual immorality. That's good enough. Don't, don't eat the blood, because it was a longstanding, you know, the, the life the life of the creature is in the blood. Don't eat the blood and don't, and don't sleep around or commit adultery, but no. Do you have to go sacrifice things at the temple? No. Do you have to be circumcised? No. Do you have to observe the Sabbath? No. But this went on for a long time. People are circulating and saying, you know, and it all falls under this secret knowledge, right? We know something you don't know. Actually, actually, you have to become a Jew to become a Christian. Actually, Jesus didn't really have a body. It was just all pretend. Uh, actually, there's an evil law. Oh, you like that. I tell you, you really like that. We'll have to go into that a little more next week. Um, now, let's talk about what Simeon mentioned, that he seems very ready to be eaten by animals, doesn't he? Just in an in, in in extreme sense. Um, and particularly in the book of Romans, I wrote down a bunch of places where he talks about it, where he says, I'm ready. I'm ready to prove myself a true disciple. I'm ready to get to God. But it's to the Romans that he really pulls out all the stops. And I just want to read a couple of sections. He says, <clears throat> um, I'm on page 103, but I'm going to skip around, but I'll try to remember to give the page. Um, it is as a prisoner for Christ Jesus, I'm just partway down that I hope to greet you, if indeed it be God's will that I should deserve to meet my end. Things are off to a good start. May I have the good fortune to meet my fate without interference. What I fear is your generosity, which may prove detrimental to me. For you can easily do what you want to, whereas it is hard for me to get to God unless you let me alone. Romans, Roman friends, Please don't go to the authorities and intercede for me and try to get me out of this. Because this is what I want. I want to prove faithful unto death to my Lord. And now I am speaking. This is Mrs. Ferguson speaking. You know what? I don't want to be eaten by wild animals. And if I had friends in the city where I was going to be fed to wild animals, and they could get me out of this without compromising my faith in any way, but they could pull strings and I could get lo loose. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'd be up for that. You know what I mean? I wouldn't, please, please do not use your influence to get me off. No, but please go ahead and use your influence. I don't, I don't want to betray Jesus, but if I don't have to do that and it, you just, you know, you have a friend in high places and he can get me let go. I would love that. This is my confession to you. Perhaps you all feel the same way. Ignatius does not. He says, please do not pull strings for me. He says, I am God's wheat, and I am being ground by the teeth of wild beasts to make a pure loaf for Christ. And you have to remember, because people today, communion is done in many different ways, but then it was a loaf of bread. It was an actual loaf of bread. And they couldn't read this without thinking of communion loaf. I am being to make a pure loaf. You know, Eucharist is the, it was the name for communion. It still is in many Christian traditions. And it means thanksgiving. The Eucharist is thanksgiving. It is an offering to God of our thanks, in addition to the offering that his son made. And Ignatius is being an offering. Do you see the, the connection? I am the loaf. I'm the offering. Just like we offer the bread, we bring it forward and put it on the altar table. And, 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 and we, we uh, believe that this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm going to be an offering too. I want to be an offering. Grind me up like flour to make me a loaf for Jesus. Um, but now, Simeon, we really get into it. Um, what a thrill I shall have from the wild beasts that are ready for me. I hope they will make short work of me. 
I shall coax them on to eat me up at once and not hold off, as sometimes happens through fear. I'm on page 105, sorry. And if they are reluctant, I shall force them to it. Come fire, cross, battling with wild beasts, wrenching of bones, mangling of limbs, crushing of my whole body, cruel tortures of the devil. Only let me get to Jesus Christ. Not the wide bounds of earth nor the kingdoms of this world will avail me anything. I would rather die and get to Jesus Christ than reign over the ends of the earth. He is a man on a mission. Very single-mindedly, I am going to lay down my life for Jesus. It is my moment. Can I say it this way? It is my moment of glory my moment to give glory to God, and my moment of glory in the kingdom. The book of Revelation shows us the martyrs gathered around in the throne room, crying out, how long, O Lord, before you revenge our blood? They're a special group in the book of Revelation, all dressed in white. They're the martyrs. And who wants to be one? He's thinking very long term. I'll, be, I'll have that status forever. I'll be one of the martyrs for eternity. And this won't last very long. It's going to be unpleasant, but it's not going to last very long. Um, uh, finally, I see our time is clicking away, as it always is. I had you read a letter um, from Polycarp. And I, will, I, will, I wrote down where these are. You'll just have to believe me. Um, Polycarp uh, is... Um, we, we hear from one of the church fathers, Irenaeus, we're going to read something by him in a little while, um, that he was a student, he himself was a student of Polycarp, and Polycarp used to tell them what the Apostle John told him. Polycarp was a student of the Apostle John. He knew someone who knew Jesus. Not only someone who knew Jesus, he was the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, John. Um, and he was the Bishop of Smyrna. He was one of the people sent to visit Ignatius on his journey. And several times, Ignatius in his letters, and a few of them, he said, you know, I have heard that the, the brouhaha in Antioch has died down. They're not arresting more people. The congregation is peace. It would be really nice if you sent someone, sent someone from your church, sort of a, a delegation to say, good job, you stood firm, now it's, you know, the heat's dying down. Maybe gathered an offering to bring them. Maybe if anyone was, I don't know, maimed and tortured. You know, if there's a family, so, some that the father was killed and the family needs support. You know, it'd be nice for you to take an offering and just go. Um, Polycarp is doing the same thing. He's writing a letter encouraging, um, he's like writing a letter to the Philippi Philippians. Writing a letter to encourage them to do this. And... Um, and he says this. This is what I want to highlight. Let your baptism be your arms, your faith your helmet, your love your spear, your endurance your armor. Does that remind you of anything? Put on the full armor of God. It's the same. They know all of these. And I asked you, how familiar is Polycarp with Scripture? Did you notice the million, that is an exaggeration, footnotes? in the letter of Polycarp um, to the Philippians. And I'm just, I'm, I've, I've randomly picked a page, okay? And what I want to point out is tons of them are new now New Testament books. In other words, you know, there was no New Testament yet. These were just letters, loose letters circulating. And I don't even know if he has copies of all of them right next to him but he knows them all. He's, he's quoted 2 Corinthians, Romans, 1 Timothy, Matthew, Acts, 1 John, uh, 1 Peter, Colossians, Ephesians, uh, 1 Clement. He, he thinks that's worthy. Um, in other places, uh, he, on the next page, he quotes Tobit, which is what was an Old Testament book, but at the Reformation, that's what... The Protestant world refers to as the apocryphal books of the Old Testament. Um, but for them, it was scripture. Um, yes, massive quotations of scripture. He is very familiar, even though he may not have copies of all of them with him. How does he know? Because he reads them over and over when he has a chance. 
Um, okay, so one last thing I want to mention. This is back to Ignatius, and he said something in the letter to the Romans that was very compelling to me. The greatness of Christianity lies in its being hated by the world, not in its being convincing to it. Hated by the world, not being convincing to it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with this. Um, let me just say, all the things you're going to read are listed in the reading guide. We're reading Eusebius, but then we're reading the next few letters. Follow your reading guide as to what to read. Don't read the introduction. Just read the text. But uh, you can mull this over over the next week. Um, modern Christianity, this is every branch, I think, spends a lot of time trying to be convincing. But we don't like being hated so much. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not dissing being convincing. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to read several apologies, all right, where they're trying to be convincing. But Ignatius says we, we can't be afraid to be hated. We can't be afraid to stand up in, for what's right. And sometimes they're going to hate us. It's unpleasant. But he said that the power of the church was in its being hated, not in its being convincing. When we stand firm on the truth, Jesus said, you know, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. He did warn us. It's not a bad thing for the church to be very other. Do you see what I mean? Um, maybe we need both, right? It's good. Apologetics is good. We're going to meet one of the next week after next, we're going to meet one of the greatest early Christian apologists who is going to lose his life for it because he was hated too. Um, I think they go together. And I think maybe we, in the modern world, we like convincing, but we don't like hated quite as much. Um, I don't like hated quite so much. How about if I just speak for me and not hook you guys in? I don't want to be hated. Don't like it. I want everybody to like me. But if we compromise the truth, it's a problem to get to get the world to like us as the church, not as individuals, as the church, as individuals too. But anyway, that's something to mull over. Um, that's part of what we sign up for when we become Christians, to be willing to be hated. And wouldn't it be interesting if the being the other, if, if standing up for this is a completely other, the world does not understand this. What is this? They didn't understand these guys. Pliny says what? They're, they're obstinate. I think just unrelenting obstinacy ought to be punished. They're just, they're just doggone stubborn. Just kill them just for being stubborn. They just, it's a little pinch of Caesar for, or incense to Caesar for crying out loud. Just do it. Okay. We are going to meet, uh, one of the things we're going to read, as I let you go, is the martyrdom of Polycarp, which pretty much ruins the story by the title. Um, in this case, it does mean death, not, he's not going to survive. But you, you saw a movie about Polycarp? That's cool. Do you remember the name of it? It had Polycarp in the title. That's a good sign that it's her. Okay. Well, you are going to read the early one of the, the earliest Christian eyewitness account of a martyrdom, the martyrdom of Polycarp, the guy we just read the, his letter to the Philippians. Okay. I've kept you like it's Tintil. Go have lunch. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.